Welcome to Truth in History, where we will discover together how history becomes prophecy in the making, and prophecy reflects history as it's being fulfilled. Now, here's your host, Pastor Charles Jennings. Welcome to the program and to our teaching series concerning the abomination of desolation. Now, this is a subject that there's a lot of different opinions that have been formed concerning this subject, the abomination of desolation. And even some, not only questions, but doubt as to what its full meaning really is. And in this series, I would like to try to bring to our attention the truth that we find in God's Word concerning the abomination of desolation, when it took place, the reason why it took place, and to whom it took place. Now, if you have your Bible, I'd like for you to follow along with me and follow the continuity of thought not only in this lesson, but in subsequent lessons, because there's been a lot of confusion as to what is the abomination of desolation that Jesus spoke of in Matthew chapter 24. Now, in Matthew 24, we read this phrase in the context when Jesus was talking about the Jewish temple being destroyed. We must keep that in mind. If we do not keep in mind the timing in which Jesus said this, the context in which Jesus made this statement, and to whom it applied, then we'll be, we will be thoroughly confused. So in Matthew 24 and beginning with verse number 1, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. That's the setting. This is the very end of the teaching ministry of the Lord Jesus. And the disciples are wanting to show him this magnificent edifice. So Jesus went out and he, he departed from the temple, and this is what he said to them. See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left one stone here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, this is the teaching ministry of Jesus. It's the very end of his teaching ministry. And they're at the temple. Jesus comes out of the temple. He looks back more or less and says, see all these things, see this temple, it's coming down. Now, what did the temple represent? The temple represented the ceremonial law structure that was in the Old Testament. It represented the whole religious order of that day, which was perverted Hebrewism. And you notice I said perverted Hebrewism because at this time in history, in the first century A.D., it was known as Phariseeism or Judaism, and it had become perverted, it had become corrupt, and it's about time that the whole system was to be destroyed, actually destroyed. So, this word abomination, first we need to define what it means. And I'm going to read from this Wycliffe Bible Encyclopedia and just a, a brief definition. This is what it says. The chief idea represented in the Hebrew words is revulsion at great wrong in religious matters. 
Since there is only one true living God, an invisible spiritual being without bodily parts, all forms of idolatry and all ceremonies and objects connected with idolatry are abhorrent to God. That's the definition that the Wycliffe Bible Encyclopedia gives to the word abomination. It's an avulsion to idolatry. It's an avulsion to not only idolatry, but wrong ideas, ceremonies, objects, icons concerning worshiping the one true and living God. There is a relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's not through physical objects or ceremonies, but when we bring something in that is revolting to God Almighty in our worship to Him, then it's an abomination. Going back to the book of Proverbs, we read these verses. Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 8. It says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. The sacrifice of the wicked. In other words, this word wicked means lawlessness. The sacrifices of the lawless is an abomination to the Lord. This is telling us that the wicked bring a sacrifice in worship to the Lord, but it's perverted worship. They're not coming to God on the right basis. So therefore, their sacrifice is an abomination. We read also in Proverbs 21, 27. Chapter 21, verse 27. The sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind or wicked intent, knowing that he's bringing a sacrifice to the Lord, but it's not the right sacrifice. It's a perverted sacrifice. It's a corrupt sacrifice. It's not the required sacrifice. So it becomes an unacceptable sacrifice to God. Now we see a perfect example of this as we go back to the book of Genesis. A very interesting passage in Genesis chapter 4, beginning with verse number 1. This is concerning Cain. Genesis 4.1 says, And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Now you notice that he brought an offering unto the Lord. It doesn't say that he offered it to a false god. He brought it to the Lord. Abel brought an offering to the Lord, the same God, the same Lord God. And Abel, he also brought the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Now, here's two brothers, Cain and Abel. Both have been trained by the same parents, Adam and Eve. No doubt Adam trained his sons in worship and the requirements of worship. You must 
bring a sacrifice, a blood offering unto the Lord. And Abel brought a blood sacrifice. Cain brought the fruit of the ground. And God refused, God refused to accept Cain's offering because it was not the proper sacrifice. And there's a possibility. It doesn't say this, but the implication is when Cain became angry and his countenance fell, it was kind of an indication of his heart. His heart possibly was not right with God anyway, because if he had been told by Adam, just like Abel was, to bring a blood sacrifice and he didn't, then that would show a form of rebellion. And he brought this offering. God says, no, I'm not going to accept that one. There can be worship. There can be praise. And I'm convinced of this, folks. There can be praise and worship even in our Christian churches today that's not acceptable before God. One of the reasons is that it seems as though modern perverted Christianity has invented or come up with a brand new Jesus. He's a politically correct Jesus. He's a religiously correct Jesus. Even this concept of Chrislam, blending Christianity with Islam or any other religion, is an abomination unto God. It's Christ and Christ alone. Now, you may accuse me of a lot of things, of maybe not believing uh, like the dispensationalist, or not believing in the, in the rapture, or not believing these other things, and that's fine. But you can never accuse me of not putting Christ at the focus of our teaching and our theology. It's Christ and Christ alone. Christ and Christ alone. Going back to our Genesis account. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt Shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin, that is a sin offering. Not sin lies at the door, but a sin offering at the door. In other words, Cain, if you would have done it right, I would have accepted your offering because there's a lamb or a goat lying right outside your door you could have conveniently sacrificed that animal, even if you had to buy it from your brother. Sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now, we see where Cain brought an offering, but it was not acceptable. Is that possible today? I think it's possible. A lot of what is called praise and worship, this is my opinion, but a lot of what we call praise and worship seems to be just an adaptation of a rock and roll concert. The great hymns of the faith concerning the great, the great doctrines of Christianity and of Scripture are laid aside. They just sang some 7-Eleven song and just sang this thing over and over and over and over again. Get hyped up, but that's not necessarily worship. We must come upon the basis of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our entrance. And in this series concerning the abomination of desolation, I want to drive home the point I want to drive home the point that 
the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, the shed blood, the sacrificial blood, the efficacious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is our only legal right to approach the throne of God and to bring an offering of sacrifice and praise. That's our only legal right. That's our credentials to enter in to the most holy place. It's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That pure, unadulterated, perfect blood of the perfect Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we get to the end of this series, you will see why I stress this point, that it's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was despised, that was rejected by the people of His day in the New Testament. The Jewish people and the Jewish leaders, that would be the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests, the elders, the doctors, the lawyers, and even the political party of the Herodians rejected the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what brought on the desolation of the temple. And we will see that when we get to the end of this series. But I want to be clear and plain because this is the critical thing. As we see in Genesis chapter 4, the blood of an animal. The blood had to be shed under this Adamic mandate in the Garden of Eden, and it was blood of the pure, perfect, sinless Son of God that was shed in the New Testament under the terms of the New Covenant to purchase our salvation. And the rejection of that blood of the Son of God. It was the outright rejection of that blood that brought on the desolation, the destruction. And I want to make that very obvious and clear because in this book that we call the Bible, there's that, as one man said, there's that red thread of blood that runs through this whole book. And that blood, whether it be under the Old Covenant or under the New Covenant, it was blood that was man's only means to transact business with God. It's the shed blood, the only legal means whereby man can transact business with God. And I might say this, you might think to yourself, I go to church, I pay, I pay tithes, I support television ministry, I help my neighbor, I'm a member of the choir. I'm a member of the praise and worship team. I might even be a minister. You might even be in Christian ministry. That's not the main thing. The main thing is, has that precious blood of Jesus been applied to your heart and soul and life? Have you repented of your sins? and accepted that precious blood of the Lord Jesus as your only means of salvation. And I'm talking to everyone. I don't care whether you be uh, of any religion, of any ethnicity. There's only one means of salvation. Only one legal means whereby we must transact business with the Almighty. 
That's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I pray that the Spirit of God will convict you and, and touch your heart and mind and spirit and bring you to a place of genuine repentance. Now, we have a magazine that we would like to mail to you, put into your hands. It's called Truth in History. And we're willing to send this to you free of charge, without obligation on your part. And there's a book list on the back of the material that's available from this ministry. You just write to us or call us on the number that is on the screen and we'll be more than happy to send it to you. Now, a lot of people have called up and said, well, I want some additional information concerning the lesson that I heard on the television, and then when they get the magazine, that lesson is not in there. Well, this lesson is not necessarily in the magazine that you call for, but eventually it will no doubt appear in a subsequent issue of the magazine somewhere, down the line somewhere. So don't be disappointed if this lesson is not found in the magazine that you receive when you call. So going back to the word abomination, according to Strong's Concordance, of which many of you have a Strong's Concordance, there are basic words that are translated abomination, and this is what they mean, disgust, abhorrence, idolatry, filthy and detestable. And then the Greek word means a detestation, basically the same thing, something that is detestable. But it's detestable not from our viewpoint, it's detestable from God's viewpoint. That's the important thing. He is the one that makes the difference. He is the one. He is the one that found idolatry so detestable in the Old Testament. Now, Adam Clark, the Methodist theologian and commentator, made the f a following comment concerning Daniel 12, 11, where this word is found. The abomination that maketh desolate set up. He said, I believe along with Bishop Thomas Newton, that this is a proverbial phrase and may be applied to anything substituted in the place of, listen closely, substituted in the place of or set up in opposition to the ordinances of God, His worship, or His truth. I want to read that again. Adam Clark said, I believe, and then he concurs with Bishop Newton, that this is a proverbial phrase and may be applied to anything substituted in the place of or set up in opposition to the ordinances of God, His worship, and His truth. So when anything is offered to God in opposition to Himself, his word, his truth, or a paganistic form of worship. And when I mean paganistic, it doesn't necessarily have to mean a form of worship that is practiced in some heathen land somewhere. Because we see an example of this in 2 Kings chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. This is during the reign of Joash, the king of Judah, or Jehoash, same man. And Jehoash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him. But the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. 
Now what is this telling us concerning the reign of King Jehoash in 2 Kings chapter 12, verses 1 through 3? It said, He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days, wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him. But he failed to remove the high places, and the, that phrase, high places, was a term denoting areas that were prepared for heathen idol worship. This man did right as long as the priest instructed him, but he failed to clean house. In our churches today, we have a syncretized religion. In some cases, it's absolutely a paganized Christianity, if you want to call it that, because they're taking the, the ways of the world, the music of the world, the dress of the world. You know, I was always taught in the church that I grew up in, taught by my parents and by the pastor, the Sunday school teacher that when you go to church, you wear your best. It's, it's a, a, a sign of respect to the house of God and to God Himself and to the rest of the Lord's people. But you can go to churches today, the way the people are dressed, it looks like they're going to a skunk fight. You just, like Grandpa said, when you go to a skunk fight, you wear your worst. It it shows a lack of respect for the institution of the house and the church. There's something wrong. You see, we want to live like the world. We want to take on the ways of the pagan. We want to take on the ways of the, of the sinner. We want to do right, but we don't want to get rid of the high places. It says the people still sacrificed and burnt offerings in the high places. Paganism in Christianity, or in the, in the Old Testament, it was Hebrewism and paganism coming together. Now it's Christianity and paganism coming together. Folks, it's time that we clean house, that we do right, but separate ourselves from the paganism that has invaded our country and invaded our churches, and walk circumspectly before a holy and a righteous God. I pray that the Lord will bless you as we continue to teach concerning the abomination of desolation. God bless you. For any material offered on this program, please write or call for your copy today. May God bless you for your response and for being a part of this end-time ministry.